If you want to know what Tibet was like before the Chinese came, the best place to visit is not in Tibet at all. Every morning just after dawn, the monks of Tikse Monastery gather in one of its many temples to chant the prayers that monks have been chanting in the Himalayas for more than a thousand years. They're not Tibetans, but Ladakhis. Their homeland is within the borders of India. But their language is a dialect of Tibetan. Their religion is Tibetan Buddhism. And the Dalai Lama, the god king of Tibet, is their spiritual leader too. <laughs> but there are Tibetans living here. People who followed the Dalai Lama into exile in 1959 and have been here ever since. Of the 100,000 Tibetan exiles in India, the 7,000 or so who've settled in Ladakh have had to change their ways the least. This is just the way they sowed their barley in the fields outside Lhasa before the Chinese came. The Chinese say that they liberated a land of impoverished serfs, exploited by 100,000 idle monks and nuns. In good Marxist eyes, the Chinese were right. But the Tibetans of Ladakh don't remember it that way. But if Thang Chub Wangmo and Dondup ever do return, will the Tibet they find resemble the land they left behind? Ladakh today, like the old Tibet, is a place where religion, land and people are so seamlessly interwoven that the work of human beings seems to grow out of the ground itself. You can see here how a Tibetan monk has laboriously carved a mantra into this stone. There's another stone with another mantra here, and another one here. In fact, this entire wall is covered in stones, each one with a mantra carved into it. It's a vivid example of the extraordinary power and longevity of Tibetan Buddhism. And here in Ladakh, these walls are still being added to stone by stone. But in Tibet itself, the exiles say, there may soon be nothing but walls and ruins and maybe a few museums left. The living culture, they say, is being strangled to death. There's a constant flow of news from across the Himalayas. Every week, a new batch of refugees arrives at the Tibetan clearing centers. Some as young as six or seven years old, they've struggled over the high mountain passes into Nepal and on to India. Most of the youngest refugees have been sent out by their parents to get the education which they can't get in Chinese Tibet. It may be years, if ever, before they see their families again. Many of the others are monks who could no longer stomach the Chinese dominance of their religion. Lodder himself was kept in police cells for six months, he told me. Anjing ni dia macam cuci ayat, cuci ayat macam ni perayaan itu dia betul jahat macam 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 macam
Lada's friend, Yeshi Gelson, was scornful of the claim that ordinary Tibetans are better off under Chinese rule. They've traveled for two days by train from the far northeast of India. Now, outside the UN building in New Delhi, they're making their voices heard. Tibetan exiles from every corner of the country have been flocking to Delhi for weeks to support a hunger strike organized by the Tibetan Youth Congress. There's a sense in the exile community that after 40 years, Time for Tibet is running out. Inside occupied Tibet, the things are getting worse and worse each passing day. The migration or government-sponsored migration of the Chinese people to Tibet is uh, making Tibetans themselves a minority in Tibet. And on that, uh, the go government policy, the Chinese government policy, itself is to destroy the Tibetan people as a race, as a country, as a nation. The demonstration over, the horse protesters make their way to the hunger strike headquarters, a street-side encampment where a shrine has been erected to the memory of Topton Godup. On the 29th of April, after 47 days without food, the first six hunger strikers were forcibly taken to hospital by Indian police. Topton was one of six more Tibetans standing by to continue the strike. But privately, he decided on more drastic action. Topton Godup died within hours. His self-immolation galvanized the world media as it was supposed to do. Now, right now we have five people here. This yeah. is the second batch of hunger strikers. Mm -hmm. uh, to the Dalai Lama, suicide is violence to the self. The hunger strike and even more Topton Godup's self-immolation were a direct challenge by the Tibetan Youth Congress to His Holiness's middle way of non-violent, peaceful negotiation. Many countries, uh, many freedom struggle fighters uh, or nations who have fought, uh, they gain independence uh, using many uh, other available means. But Tibetans uh, remain peaceful and we tried to be peaceful till today. But we are very, very far away from our goal. And our future generation will say, look at the Tibetans. They fought a non-violent war and they lost. So it's bullshit. Uh, you try your way. To discover just how radical such ideas are, you have to travel to the heartland of the Tibetan exiles world. Not Ladakh or New Delhi, but the town of Dharamsala, in the foothills of the Himalayas, in the far northwest of India. This is the town where the Indian government ensconced the Dalai Lama when he fled Tibet in 1959. Ever since, it's been a favorite destination for Western seekers after enlightenment and the mystic spirituality of the East.
the spanking new Namgyan Monastery near the Dalai Lama's house. The monks still mark the Buddhist calendar with the complex rituals that evolved over more than a thousand years of seclusion behind the Himalayas. The foreigners are not resented. Much of the support Tibetans have been able to garner in the West has been generated by visitors like these, disciples of the Buddhist creed of love and peace and compassion. But some Tibetans do resent the notion that their country was some perpetual Shangri-La. From a tiny set of offices in Dharamsala, for example, the Amnamachi Institute analyzes military and economic trends in China. Between 1912 and 1950, when Tibet was independent, says director Jamyam Norbu, it was a small but modern army that kept the Chinese out. Everybody knows that it, to a certain extent it wasn't just prayers and pujas and the blessings of holy men that kept our country free. It was through rifles and the courage of soldiers and uh, volunteers that did it. But the problem is, uh, in the West, people want to, in some ways, um, idealize Tibetans as these very peaceful, hobbit-like characters living in the mountains, and which is totally untrue. Every morning in the monastery courtyard, novice monks practice the ancient art of theological debate. But not every Tibetan, says Jamyam, wants to be a monk. And not every Tibetan believes that preserving Buddhist culture should be the top priority. The Tibetans, uh, first and foremost, don't need world peace. They need their country back. We are not saints. We do not claim to be saints. We are ordinary Tibetans. We have to pay the taxes. We have to pick up the shit in the end. We have to defend the frontiers. You know, we are the ones who have the wife and the wailing, screaming kids and, you know, that whole messy life that we have to lead. When you are a, a layman, you need that land, you need Tibet. If, you're, if you don't have that land, if you don't have control over your life, men end up uh, becoming alcoholics and beating their children and beating their wives as many, many other, uh, let's say, indigenous people all over the world have unfortunately done. And I do not want to see my society, you know, go down that unfortunate path. The Dalai Lama is away in America. For two hours this afternoon, a hundred or so devout Tibetans gather in the community center to pray for his safety. They'll be back tomorrow and every other day until their god king returns to them. But when they've gone at six o'clock, a very different group with a much more defiant outlook will take over the center. The Rangzen Yaks is a youth club formed by Jamyam Norbu. Rangzen means independence, and there are plenty of young Tibetans, Jamyam believes, who are ready and willing to fight for it. I think what a lot of these young people need, more than anything, is the, f the feeling of being needed by their society and by their country. But yet they do not see any call. A lot of them feel uh, very upset by it. You just can't fob them off all the time by saying, you, know, you just be good and listen to your elders. Be subservient to the church. Be subservient to the Dalai Lama. Say your prayers, do your mantras, be good. Who wants to hear this anymore? Most of the younger Tibetans want to get their country back through some physical activities. Most of the youngsters have already trained. They are more or less uh, ready for everything. This is a thing like that we want to pinch. When you get pinch on your skin or things like that, you hurt, right? You'll feel, ah, you know, so we want to do this. We want to be fast, as fast as we can, you know. But Otherwise obviously, we lose everything. His Holiness is never going to agree to the use of violent methods. I mean, yeah. we know that about him. Right. Yeah. Where does that leave you? That leaves in a contradictory, I guess, a dilemma. But it's, um, 
it's to a point where the, the anxiety and the, the inks, the, you know, like just the feelings of like each generation is getting less and less Tibetan. The more we stay in India, we're becoming more like Indians. The more we stay in Canada or Australia or, or wherever. Like we are losing all, you know? That's right. <laughs> For 40 years, the Tibetan community in Dharamsala has seen its main job as keeping alive the Tibetan language, culture and religion, until sometime the great wheel turns and it can take its living treasures home. But the response among the exiles to the hunger strike in Delhi is just one sign that the Dalai Lama's calls for peace and patience are wearing thin. We get a lot of letters from Tibet, inside Tibet, occupied Tibet, and also from outside Tibet, uh, from the Tibetan exiles, and asking the question to the Tibetan Youth Congress Central Executive, saying, how long can we go like this? We did not come here to preach non-violence. We did not come here to teach our religious teachings. Of course, that is part of our tradition. We do that. That's fine. But our primary goal and uh, the basic uh, idea that we are here as refugees to go back to a free Tibet and we are fighting for a free Tibet. So if we could not uh, gain that from non-violent method, then the future generations certainly will think otherwise. Back in Ladakh, each week while the hunger strike was on, the Tibetans carried candles through the streets of Leh, the capital to honor the would-be martyrs. But unless it gets some response, the compassion of the Tibetan exiles may indeed soon fade away. A resort to armed force against the might of China, most admit, would be little more than a futile gesture. But better, some now believe, than submissively hoping and praying while their country itself fades away.